On the surface, all can look calm, denying the turbulent truth that lurks beneath. Things seem so good. Every ripple causes pain, division, and distraction, echoing out and churning up the waters of our faith. You'd think we would have figured it out by now. If only I'd spoken louder or taught clear his truth. Would these waves of confusion and doubt have stilled by now? It's all a haze, murky waters, and dimming light. Our divine purpose and mission seem so distant, almost out of reach. Where do we go from here? Yet in spite of the chaos, there's a stillness, a clarity, a beckoning to remember the timeless wisdom and teaching that echoes back to his loving light. Dear Church, Good morning, everyone. <laughs> that was me. Well, we all got an extra hour this morning, or last night, right? You feel it? Anybody feel it? Yes, a little bit. I felt it. I woke up an hour early. <laughs> so, but welcome this morning. We're so glad you're here. For those of you in the room, we're glad you're here. Skagit Online Church is so grateful to be here today. So before we start, I always need some prayer before we dig in. We're going to be talking about 1 Corinthians 12 today, and I'm so excited to talk about we are the body. So let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this beautiful morning that you've given us, this crisp fall morning. God, thank you even for the extra hour of sleep that you gave us today. You're so good to us in so many ways. And so, God, as we open your word this morning, I pray, Lord, that you would reveal yourself to us. I pray, God, as Jeremiah prayed, that your words would be in my mouth and you would lead and direct. And so, Father, we just thank you for this chance that we have to be together. And we ask this in your name. Amen. There's a story of a man named Ernest Shackleton, and he and his crew, 27 men, over 100 years ago, on December 5, 1914, they were aiming to achieve the first land crossing of the continent of Antarctica. But right before reaching landfall, their ship, which was named Endurance, became trapped in the vast expanse of the Antarctica sea ice. So after abandoning the ship, Shackleton and his crew, they endured 21 months on the frozen tundra. You know, it was brutally cold, and, you know, I can't even imagine, because think of all the things that we have today that help us in the below zero weather. Now, we don't experience that here in the Pacific Northwest, but I, many of you have been to climates like that. I have as well, where it's just so, so cold. And they were forced to survive on this frozen tundra with dwindling food supplies. But Ernest Shackleton, as their leader, he believed in helping the men in structure and routine every day and gave every man a job and every man a skill, according to their skill, so that they would accomplish one goal. And you see the picture of the ship there trapped in the ice. And then here's a picture of the men, the group of men that were on that frozen tundra. But the reason that he kept them organized and in a routine daily was to they could accomplish the one goal that they had, of course, was survival. They didn't have those massive land uh, rovers, whatever they call them, to go on the ice. They didn't have cell communication, satellite towers. They didn't have helicopters, you know, to come in and know that these men were out there stuck. And these men didn't necessarily know each other very well before they joined this journey. There was actually a rumor put out that Shackleton had put an ad in the newspaper that had said, anybody ready for a big adventure? You might not come back, was basically what it said. So these men had to learn to develop community even more so when they knew that they couldn't free the ship from the ice. They had really no choice if they were to survive. They had to learn to depend on one another and each other's gifts and abilities and skills day to day. And it was recorded that they also kind of had a sense of community outside of their daily jobs. 
to keep the morale up. So Shackleton would have them do things. They would dress up and pretend they were at the Ritz-Carlton, a famous hotel. They would have contests. They played soccer on the ice. All this working together to accomplish the great goal of survival. You know, we talk a lot about community here at Cornwall, but what does it really mean according to the Bible? Like, what does it mean? We aren't necessarily stuck on a ship in the ice, but in some ways, the dire circumstances of Shackleton's men and their need to survive is similar to the church today staying afloat in an ever-increasing hostile world towards Christianity. And I find it fascinating that the ship was called Endurance. If we've come through anything and learned anything through the past few years is that we've had to learn how to work together and also in a greater way, knowing and believing that yes, we are the church. We are the church, the body in Jesus Christ. And we are kind of on a ship in life, so to speak, called endurance because we know that life is hard. Life has ups and downs. And Luke 21, 19 says, by your endurance, you will gain your life. And more than ever, knowing, believing, and acting like the church and even enduring together is so important if we're going to, like Mike talked about, Pastor Mike, just, just now about radically loving others to helping them find and follow Jesus. So Paul talks about what community might look like by using the analogy of the physical body. And we know that in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, and we're going to dig into this passage a little bit, but the, one of the verses I just want to highlight right now is verse 27, and it says, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. It's an emphatic statement that Paul is saying that you as an individual, me as an individual, we are all a part of the greater body of Christ. Now we've learned over the past several weeks of studying 1 Corinthians, looking into 1 Corinthians, the many ways that the church of Corinth was similar to kind of the big C church today. And in the first chapter, Paul addresses some things that are happening, and right away he tells them to set aside their differences and their divisions. So here's a little bit of a review or some extra facts for us as we kind of get some context for what we're looking at today. The cosmopolitan city of Corinth was the site of one of Paul's greatest evangelistic successes, and it was extremely wealthy as well. It had great prosperity. It was situated strategically, geographically, so there was a lot of wealth that came as a result of that, where they were situated. But despite Paul having founded the church there, there was also a lot of contention and str strife going on. There was dissension that ran the gamut from questions about leadership to sexual immorality. Some believers in chapter 6 were taking other Christians to court. There were questions about marriage, celibacy, food offered to idols, public worship, and spiritual gifts. Some, after conversion, were not living morally pure lives. And so Paul offered some of his most profound thinking on the body of Christ, love, and resurrection. So culture impacted their thinking on a number of letter levels, so he had to address this in his letters because they were so individualistic in their thinking, even to the point of status, people having different status and people who had higher status, maybe wealthier status, thinking they should have a better position or that they were more superior to others in the body at Corinth. Or they might prefer different kinds of speakers with a radical style or someone that might have been had manual labor, they weren't as willing to listen to someone as someone who was educated. So as a result, the church became divided by factions and there was spiritual immaturity. So does this sound any familiar like for the Western church at all? Can we, can we see some of these things? And this sounds a little bit familiar, but Paul uses the analogy of the physical body and its many parts to describe how the body of Christ should function. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I'm going to read for you verses 12 to 18. 
as we start here. So it says the body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ, for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. So Paul is saying here, these are the reasons that we are the body is because of the commonality, the common denominator, which is Jesus Christ. Now the body, verse 14, is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. So what Paul is trying to communicate to these, the immature parts of the Corinthian church is that everyone matters in the body. There's not one part of the body that is more significant than the other. And he talks about that in the verses after verse 18. So at times, we even can get a mixed message. On one hand, in our culture, we are told to give ourselves away, to take care of the marginalized, and it's really what the social justice movement has been all about. And then on the other hand, what our culture is telling us today is that we are individuals worthy of finding our dreams, you deserve more, do it your way, fulfilling our every want, and we, our right is to live happily ever after. Now, in and of itself, some of these things, like finding your dreams, finding what you're good at, aren't necessarily bad things, but we need to look at them from a biblical perspective. The message the world gives us, which is opposite of what Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So the messages that the world gives us are countercultural to what the Bible teaches overall. And we know that, don't we? Because it isn't, we know that it's not just about us, right? In this instance, even more so, it's not about us, as Paul talks about what the body looks like. He was instructing the Corinthians, just like I just read from Romans 12, to renew our mind, that they need to think differently about what it means to be the church and the body of Christ and not just think about ourselves as an individual. There's some research that shows that being in community or being in a body and serving reliably makes us happier. In fact, it may make us healthier and help us live longer as well. And brain science shows us that our brains release endorphins when we help others as well, which leads to a similar phenomenon. It's called a helper's high. It's a literal state of euphoria that happens. Those endorphins that are released, endorphins are released, I don't know if you know this, is when you sing. When, so when we worship here, endorphins are released. When you exercise, endorphins are released. That gives you that kind of that good, good sense of feeling. There's a Chinese saying that goes, if you want happiness for an hour, take a nap. If you want happiness for a day, for those of you who like to go fishing, go fishing. If you want happiness for a year, inherit a fortune. If you want happiness for a lifetime, help somebody. So when we neglect to look for our happiness or our contentment apart from the Bible, the outcome can reflect our culture rather than a biblical worldview. Again, remember Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. In other words, don't be squeezed into the mold of what our culture is telling us. And just like Corinth, we shouldn't be surprised, especially today, that we have been moving further and further away from a biblical worldview, and we have seen a radical shift even in the last five to ten years. George Barna, who's a lifelong researcher, says this, that the current incidence of adults with a biblical worldview is the lowest since the early 1990s. And he goes on to say, he cautions that 
the young people are the ones that are the most aggressive of rejecting biblical, a biblical worldview. But there's some good news. The good news is in the last year or two, there has been a slight uptick in people investigating and being curious about a biblical worldview. So like the church of Corinth, we're about 82% of what Barna calls world citizens. In other words, 82% are live life influenced more by our culture than developing a worldview. And we've moved away from maintaining long-term commitments to our local churches. We have chosen instead to focus upon experiencing God at the individual level. And I don't know how many of you have heard someone say, well, I'm a Christian and I love Jesus, but I don't believe in organized religion. Or said, you know, I'm a Christian, but I can just stay home and worship God in the privacy of my four walls. I don't need to be with other Christians. That's an example of the culture squeezing us into its mold and saying that my Christianity is individualistic and I don't need other people. In other words, that's being more independent than interdependent and it's totally opposite of what Paul is saying here. Barna also said that spiritual enlightenment comes from diligence in a discovery process rather than commitment to a faith group and perspective. So that's happening more and more. Are you depressed yet? <laughs> well, don't be. I know when I hear things like this, and I'm like, oh, this sounds so sad. You know, but it just means Jesus is coming. That's good. These things have to happen. But it also stirs something in me, like to be a cheerleader and to rally and say, hey, let's do this. Let's be the body. Let's be the church. Let's impact our community. And I know that's what we want to do here. And I know that that's why you're here, because you love Jesus and you want to make a difference. So let me say this one last thing before you take up a stone and stone me. <laughs> but we are a culture steeped in individualism. We are a culture steeped in individualism. And like the Corinthians, instead of thinking we are a significant part of the body, I hate to say this, but sometimes we treat church as like we're consumer driven. Okay, we have this mentality, what's in it for me? So, I mean, I even know of people church shopping, and I've even done this myself at times, is, you know, what's in it for me? Do I like the worship? Do I like the way they teach? Do I like their children's program? Do I like the way the parking lot is? And on and on and on. We treat it like other things in our lives instead of showing up sometimes and saying, I'm a part of the body. I'm a part of the body of Christ. And yes, I hope they have some things that will meet some of these needs, but what can I do here to make an impact? You know, we can blame it on my generation, the baby boomers, um, because we've been referred to as the me generation. So before you get up in arms, I said, and pick up the second stone and stone me, there's new research that indicates that people actually started to increase to become more self-centered 100 years ago. So, whew, everybody in the room, we're off the hook. <laughs> there was a study done in the, at the University of Waterloo. They covered a 150-year period, and they looked at our culture, specifically in the U.S., of why people became more independent and less reliant on family ties and conformity and duty. And they called this phenomena individualism. And they found that as the U.S. society shifted from manual labor, like after the Industrial Revolution from the factories, to people moving into offices and doing those more, a lot of more of those jobs, that helped to promote self-direction and ultimately facilitate individualism because more people became educated as well. So how do we counter this individualism? It takes intentionality to go against our Western individualism and operate the way God intended the church to operate? How can we change our mindset? How can we apply Romans 12 too and not conform to the pattern of the world? So he talks about this in 1 Corinthians 12, and this is what we're going to look at. So the first thing we, we look at, here's some reasons that I've found in this passage that we can look at. First of all, Diversity and unity are not accidental characteristics of the body. Diversity and unity are not accidental 
characteristics of the body. We all bring in diversity. We have different personalities. We have different, you know, uh, experience, life experiences, different ages. We all bring a uniqueness and ethnicity into the body of Christ. And so they're not accidental because in chapter 12, verse 14, it said, it is not one member, but many. Even so, the body is not made up of one part. It's made up of many parts. It's not one. And Ephesians 4, 25 also has the phrase, Paul was addressing how they were talking to each other, and he was making the point that even so, because you're, you are members of one another, so you should talk nice to each other, because we're members of one another. So it says, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Romans 12, 4 also says the same thing, one of the same, similar, I should say, not the same. And let me read that to you. It says, Romans 12, 4, Just as each of us has one body with the many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So that, again, points to the diversity and the unity is not accidental. It is actually a part of what God intended. So the second thing is, if we are Christ followers, we can't opt out. Every part is necessary. If you and I claim to be Jesus followers, we cannot opt out of the body of Christ. It's just not biblical. We, have, we can't push the unsubscribe button. How many of you get massive emails? You know, like you sign up, you buy something, or, they want, or you want a free download or something, and they say sign up. Well, then every week or every couple of days, you get all these emails, and you can't do is what the picture shows Push the unsubscribe button if you belong to the body of Christ, because we are the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12, 15 to 16, again, let me read this to you. It says, now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. So whatever excuse that we have, the thinking, oh, I'm just not as gifted as them, or oh, I just don't have this, or I'm just not sure, whatever, Paul is saying here, you can't say that, <laughs> because every part is important. So if we say Cornwall is our church, then it means that we are a part of a whole, not just an individual who comes for weekend services. We have to do away with that thinking, that individualism thinking, and realize that we are part of something greater than ourselves, the body of Christ in the church. When we have to somehow shed this concept, as I've had conversations with other people, of that the individualism is better because this is what our society preaches to us. But Paul says, again in verse 17, if the whole body were an eye. And as one commentary, some things that I read said, if we were all just individuals and not a body, that would be a monster. Right? If we were all just individuals and not a body, that would be a monster. Here's how the Message Bible says this. I want you to think about how all this makes you more significant, not less. A body isn't just a single part blown up into something huge. It's all the different but similar parts arranged and functioning together. I love the way that Eugene Peterson says that. So the purpose of working together as a body, one of the purposes of working together of the body and bringing all of our skills, our talents, our abilities, our personalities, our ups and our downs is what Ephesians 4.12 says, to equip the saints for the work of ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. For the building up of the body of Christ. And why? Because we know, and here's my third point, is that the body is God's idea. This is God's idea. This is not your church's idea, the leadership here at Cornwall. This is not their, our idea. It is God's idea. He has arranged it, as we read 
In fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be, 1 Corinthians 12, 18. So he has arranged it the way that he desires. You know, several years ago, I was on staff at a church outside of Seattle, and for 15 years, I helped to uh, lead and direct a ministry called Christmas Dessert Theater. This was a big thing in the 90s and early 2000s for evangelism, where you would invite your neighbors, and you come, and we, we would have this lavish um, event where we would have valet parkers and in uh, tuxedos, cider servers come in. The church was lavishly decorated. We would have this musical program and an, an opportunity for people to respond to a next step, not necessarily to pray to receive Christ that night, but to a next step. And so it was such a beautiful picture of watching the body work together because everybody was needed from carpenters to people that were willing to stand out in the cold to park, to people to make food, to people to decorate, to people to sing, to people to watch children, to people to make food for the cast. And as I sat up in the sound booth night after night, performance after performance, I would just smile with tears in my eyes and thank God that this was such a beautiful picture of us working together to help others find and follow Jesus. It was one of the highlights of of those kind of years that God was developing my own leadership gift. But the one thing I learned during that time, it wasn't just about me. There was years that I had to learn to let go, to think I didn't need, I couldn't possibly do it all. But it wasn't about me. It was about inviting and empowering other people to use their gifts. So number four is God not only arranged it, but he created it to be this way. He not only arranged it, but he created it to be this way. And I have to say that, you know, God has created all of us in such unique ways, hasn't he? And he is, and I wish we had time to go into the actual spiritual gifts because those are so powerful in and of themselves. And why? Because they are supernaturally given to every single person who calls them a Christ follower and wants to be a part of the body. So God created all of us to be a part of the body. And in verse 21, again, we know, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. So we can't say that of each other. We can't say, I don't need you, or I don't need to be a part. You guys just do just fine the way you are. The reason that this was so pressing in Paul's letter is that there were factions brewing in Corinth, and higher status members were somehow making the others feel lesser. And so that was kind of creating some of these disputes. But I love the way the New Living Translation says, verses 22 to 25. It says, in fact, some of the parts of the body that seemed weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. And as we know, it goes on to say in that passage, when one part of the body suffers, the rest suffer. When one is honored, the rest rejoice with it because we are the body of Christ. And again, one of the main purposes is the purpose of God carefully arranging the body is so that there would be no division or little division. Let's, say, let's go for no division. <laughs> so that we would have unity. Because when we are so hung on to our individualism and it's more important to be right than to be into right relationship, that can cause problems. So he says in verse 22 that those that seem to be weaker are necessary are, and are indispensable. I love that. That see that all the parts are needed and those that we think are indispensable, I mean are weaker, are indispensable. So what is the message for us today at Cornwall? What is, our, what, what is the message for us? Here's my shameless plug over the last few minutes here. We need everyone to be a part of the body here at Cornwall. 
We need you to find out. I need you to find out. I need to find out. You need to find out for yourself. What part of the body are you? Are you an eye? Are you an ear? Are you a baby toe? Are you a toenail? Are, what part of the body are you? You know, I think the pandemic has helped us go deeper into our individualism because we were so isolated. And please hear me, I'm not pointing any fingers today. I too fell into this mindset. And it took us all by surprise. And I honestly think, you know, the church has been struggling since the last, even the last few years to kind of do a reset of what do we look like now again after coming out of this. And I know that some of us are very tired and we're bone weary. And some of us can barely come on the weekends or tune in online because we're just so tired. We're just weary in our souls. And you know, there are times when we do need to come and sit and, re, you know, and heal. When life hits us pretty hard, we need to kind of take a break and step back. But as verse 26 says, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. So when we're even taking a step back, we're still being a part of the body and not being isolated. But can I encourage you, if you're feeling a little lonely, maybe you're bruised, maybe you've even experienced some church hurt, can I encourage you that the way to have your soul refreshed and restored is to actually become a part of the body, to show up. And even if you don't have, feel like you have much to offer, just to show up, because it's in that, that's an antidote for healing. You know, over 10 years ago, I experienced some pretty significant church hurt, and I took a step back for a, a, a little while, and I realized that that wasn't super healthy for me, because I know I needed the body. I needed the body. I needed my Christian brothers and sisters to help me, even though I was hurting, because I still believed in the church. The church is made up of imperfect people, and we are going to get hurt sometimes. But Jesus is our head, and he's the one that helps us navigate through that. So remember the brain science that when we help or when we come a part of community, it actually reduces, releases endorphins and promotes well-being. So you've heard already that our mission here at Cornwall is to help others find and follow Jesus. And I want to tell you, it's not just the role of the staff. It's not just the role of the elders. It's not just the role of the part-time workers and the full-time staff to make this happen. Now, it takes over 43 staff, okay, between our campuses to make things happen, to see what you see here on the weekends here in Skagit and online, and even over 300 volunteers. We include those at Skagit and online, all that it takes to do children's ministry, to do next gen, to do the adults, to, to do what you see here. And alone here, just at our Bellingham campus, the Explorers League, when I was talking with Nikki this week, she says it takes about 125 here. And I would venture to say, uh, Skagit, I'm not sure, but I'm going to take a stab at it. It would take probably 40 people or so more just to do your children's ministry down there. But I know that right now here in Bellingham that we're short about 35 to 40 people, especially in the second service. And the next gen as well, they have Uriah from the Bellingham campus here told me that it takes about 42 people to make it happen, volunteers, and he's short about 20. And Skagit, I'm sure, has needs as well with their, their next gen ministry as well. So all of us, we need everybody stepping up together. So practically speaking, besides feeling weary, burned out, I know it isn't intentional. I know you don't wake up and you come and you sit and you just think, oh, I just don't want to be a part of this church. I know that's not how people genuinely feel. I know sometimes it really isn't intentional. We just get stuck. And I also know that in a big church, it's harder. In a big church, it looks like everything's all put together because everything is functioning so well at times that it looks like, oh, there really isn't a place for me. But I want to tell you, there is a place for you. And God wants to empower each of us supernaturally, spiritually, to be a part of the body. And please don't think that 
platform gifts or what you see are visible, more visible, that those are more significant. That's kind of what our culture screams to us, is that that kind of that putting people up higher, that that makes them more special. It really doesn't. We need everybody, all hands on deck. So we'd like to help you explore what it looks like of how you could find out or maybe affirm, maybe you're in a new season and sometimes new seasons, we, we shift and we transition to doing different things. So there's two ways we're gonna offer that this week. First is we have a spiritual gift test that you can take. You can go to our website and find it there. It's under, when I looked, it was under events because we're also offering a spiritual gift, discovering your passion, ability, skills, gift, class here at the Bellingham campus at 11 o'clock next week. So if that would be of interest to, to you, I would love to see you there and we'll explore this together. And for those of you online that are in the area and you would love to come, we'd love to have you join us. And so there are those two ways. You have renewing your gifts, kind of figuring out what they are, and taking the class. So I started off by telling you about Shackleton. And you know, because everyone was a part, they offered their skills and their gifts, and they survived. Miraculously, all 28 men survived. For them, it was a life and death experience. And in many ways, we as the greater church are also in a life and death situation, spiritually speaking. The church is on a slippery slope of having an influence in our society. And if the church, our church, our church here at Cornwall is going to flourish, we need all hands on deck to break through the ice and make a difference in our culture right here in Whatcom County. Remember your Lego piece that you had that we gave out several weeks ago? Just, I pray that you would take that this week and pray over that and say, God, what part of the body should I be doing if you're not actively involved right now? And Pastor Bob asked us a question a few weeks back of what would Cornwall look like if everyone was like me? And so I wanna add another question, and please hear my heart before I share this question. I'm not trying to manipulate or point fingers or anything. I just want us to think about this this week. If my church did not exist any longer, would anyone care? Would anyone notice that my church made an impact in the community? It's just a question I'd love for you to think about. And to, to know that there's no such thing as an independent Christian. Yes, we have our personal relationship with Jesus, and I'm all for silent solitude time at times. We have a personal relationship with Jesus, but we are also called to be a part of the body of Christ. They work in tandem together. So let's commit to be the greater body of Christ together here at Cornwall. And let's see how God can use us in these next years to make even a greater impact where we live.